All right, Celeste. It's good to have you here Thanks today. For have, thanks for y'all for coming yeah, here. Cool. So we are here at UT Gardens Jackson, mm -hmm. just kind of going all around the grounds. And we are standing at our rain garden cool. demonstration okay. area. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, right. rain gardens are, they can be beautiful, but they are also <laughs> functional okay. and have a real purpose. So okay. as we can see here, uh, rain gardens are depressed planting areas. Mm -hmm. So when we're getting ready to actually create one, we need to, you're going to need to do some excavation on the front end. Okay. So First one thing we want to stay away from is establishing rain gardens in areas that already hold water. Ah, that's right? Good point. So that's that good would point. be called a bog garden. Okay. Okay. Yes. A bog. Yeah. All right. Rain gardens, uh, utility purpose is to catch rainwater and help infiltrate it into the soil profile. Okay. So I feel like this is perfectly situated. Um, I don't know if the viewers can see, but there's a home over mm -hmm. here on this side, and we have gutters, obviously, that are directed towards uh, towards this rain garden. Okay. There's also this area of impervious surface. We've mm -hmm. got uh, the paved driveway area. We've got sidewalks. So when we planned this garden, we used all of this in our calculations to determine the size of the garden, and the depth of the garden okay. that we would need to catch the rainfall that would come from an average rain event. And here in Tennessee, that's about a half of an inch is our average okay. uh, rain event. So that's what we based our measurements off of. Another thing that okay. we wanna uh, check before we s actually start constructing a rain garden is infiltration of the existing soil. Good. So you wanna do a percolation test. Okay, so what do we mean by a perk test? Okay, so it's super important that we understand what rate of infiltration our soils okay. are going to be able to tolerate Good. because that's the purpose of a rain garden sure, sure. to catch Good. and infiltrate water recharge that groundwater okay so we're going to dig a hole that's 12 inches deep right. the hole needs to have straight sides we don't want it straight tapered sides. okay so make sure we have straight okay. sides you fill it up with water and allow it to completely drain that's what we call we're charging it okay. essentially um, we're just saturating the, the soil in that area. Then you come back and fill it up a second time. So you fill it up again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then you measure how long it takes for the water to drain out of that hole. Okay. Got and it. in those documents we're going to post on the site, you'll there'll be a chart there. Um, okay, if good. it's in within this range of inches per hour, you're at a slow rate. Okay. This one is a medium. This range is high rate. Okay. And you want to aim for medium and high rates of infiltration. If you fall into the low range of infiltration, we need to look for a different site for wow. our rain garden okay. or it's or, going yeah, or, or it's going to require some amendments. Ah, okay. We're going to have to do some some things to drill down through, possibly hard pans. Oh, wow. We're gonna need to incorporate uh, some some organic materials, okay. sand possibly to help uh, lighten that soil structure and help with infiltration. Got it. So okay. that's the number one priority when we're picking our spot is making sure that we're gonna be able to let that water move down the way it should. Okay, so you gotta do a perk test. Yes, okay. so then once we have all these numbers together, we have the square footage of the impervious surfaces, okay. the roof, Oof that's feeding the rain garden, the sidewalks, also a uh, sheet flow of the lawn, okay. right? Coming directly into the rain garden could be a factor. Once we have those areas and our infiltration rate um, determined, then we can bring all that together to figure out the dimensions of our rain garden and what is actually going to be um, most useful in that particular residential area. Okay. So that's what we've done here. And this garden is about 10 years old. Okay. It's gone through a few facelifts. <laughs> <laughs> so our planting <laughs> plan is not the same as it was sure. when we first came in. <laughs> but what we do like to encourage folks is to plant in swaths. So it's a little more visually appealing if you have several, like say three or four of a type of plant okay. instead of one of this and one of that. So let me ask you this. So the plant material has to be able to withstand some water, right? Yes. So some wet feet. Good point. Okay. So there on that that uh, distinction between a ball garden and a rain okay. garden. So these plants can tolerate submersion. Okay. Um, 
up to t up to 48 hours of submersion in the deepest zone. Got it. So some of these plants would be things that you would find naturally growing in swampy type kind of areas. Okay. Makes sense. And then as we work our way yeah. up, okay. obviously we get higher and higher. So then we've got a mid zone. Got it. Those plants are supposed to be able to tolerate about 24 hours of submersion. And then once you get into your upper zone here at the very top, that's basically, it's really close to just your regular average garden site. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Good stuff. So the closer That's you good. get to the edge, the more, uh, you know, common type plants that you might would plant. Things you would find like in your perennial borders. Okay. So we've tried to plant everything in here yeah. with native species. Now that is not a requirement okay. for a rain garden. You do not have to stay strictly um, native, but that's just an angle that we wanted to take um, for this particular garden. And we have plenty of resources out there, sure. um, plant lists. Um, we've got uh, publications that are going to help you do all those calculations to figure out the size and dimensions of your rain okay. garden. So definitely check out uthort.com. uthort.com. We'll try to have those publications on our website. Excellent. Yes. Good, good, good. So all these things are going to be available for people to use. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think what, maybe what else should we talk about? You want to highlight a couple plants? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of these plants okay. here, especially this one right here, right? Yes, yes. So this is a fun little plant. This particular cultivar I think is called Sugar Shack. So it's a little <laughs> smaller than the typical one, but it's a button bush okay. is a common mm -hmm. name what folks might be familiar with. You can tell we've just passed our season of yeah. bloom there. Um, they have the cutest little white puffball like uh, blooms that cover it. So this is a really cool plant and it's one of those that can tolerate some of the longest submersion. You'll see it's it. planted way down here deep okay. in uh, the concave of the garden. This yeah, is, what is this massive plant? Yeah, right? this is pretty unique. This um, is a willow leaf spice bush. Okay. And um, so we know that this is a host plant to our swallowtails, oh, yeah. right? So we're doing some things there for our pollinators um, and uh, native ecosystems right there. But it's kind of growing wild on us. It could probably <laughs> use a little pruning to it's get huge. it back into check. Um, also, this right here to my right, this is a plant that I love. It's mm -hmm. called Baptisia. This is one of the um, straight species, so it's not, you know, a named cultivar. It's not, doesn't have super flashy blooms. Okay. It does have blooms in the summertime, but they're, I mean, in the early spring, but they're nestled, you know, more down into the okay. foliage. They don't stand up on top like some of the newer cultivars do. And tell us about the pods. Yes, so these are really cool. You can see, you can see here, oh, nice. um, the seed pods and they kind of shake. They have the seeds on the inside, and so you can shake those. Kids actually, back in the day, would use those as neat little, fun little toys. Pop them open, got oh, a whole bunch of seeds, seeds in there. In there. Yeah. They'll grow easily from seed. That's actually how this little grove spread itself around. Okay. We started with one plant, and it's just progressed. Yeah, it's here's, here's a new one coming yeah. on right there in the front. So Baptisia is a great pla uh, plant for rain gardens. Okay. This, this monstrosity Huge. right here, <laughs> This is ironweed, so you might, a lot of people, you know, think this is a weed. Well, I mean, it's got weed well, in the name. Yeah, yeah. so weed all depends on where it's planted and what you want to use sure. it for. But it loves the moisture. It towers above us. It yeah, has tall. purple blooms later in the summer. So that's a fun plant. Okay, and we're sitting here looking at the rain garden now. We had not had rain in a long oh. time. It's been hot and dry, but you can see the plants are still surviving. Though. Oh, yeah, they're gorgeous. See? So. The, the main differentiation between rain gardens and ball gardens is that these plants, while they do love periods of submersion, um, they also can thrive in droughty type environments. Yeah, that's so obvious. Right? They don't require constant moisture. And so that's the key. They can tolerate it, they like it, but they don't require constant moisture. Celeste, thank you so much. That's real good. We're just so glad to have y'all out here. Thanks for coming and visiting. And we're glad to be here. And if the folks are here locally, they can just stop by and oh, yeah. take a look, right? Gardens are open okay. um, every day of the week, sun up to sundown. All right, thank you much. Come on out. All right. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please click the subscribe button below.